Hi, good morning. Today we're talking about electronic funds transfer. And when we talk about electronic funds transfer, we are simply referring to transfer of funds using electronic means. And these are very important concepts in terms of e-commerce. E-commerce essentially brings short fund on an online form to people and therefore transfer of cash and other information to add to their, their tokens is very important in this. Now, on this first slide, we're talking about the types of electronic funds transfer. And essentially, there are two types of electronic funds. Um, we have what we call the wire transfer. And then the arch, which is automated clearing house. Now, these are the two major transfer. Of course, recently there have been a lot of other uh, ways and methods of transferring cash seamlessly. But these are the traditional methods of transferring cash. Now, it's important to note that. The central bank of every country is responsible for the transfer of funds. So the, the central bank, for instance, the Bank of Ghana, is responsible for transferring all funds. Now let's dive a little deep. We want to look at the wire transfer, uh, the first of the two. And wire transfer essentially has three main components. The first one is the Fed or national wire, which is between two banks in a country. The second is the book transfer, which is transfer within the same bank from brand to brand, et cetera, et cetera. Then the third component is the wire, foreign wire, which is essentially transferring funds from a bank in country to another bank outside the country. Now, here's how it works. Every bank in the country is expected to deposit what we call a backup fund at the central bank. This becomes the working fund or working capital for the banks to be able to do day-to-day -day transactions. Anytime banks transfer funds from one bank to the other bank, this funds is kept, is deposited, or the transfers are made by the national banks, which is the central banks, form the deposits of these funds. At the end of trading or at the end of the day's business at 6 p.m., you know, then these things are now opened and the necessary transfers are made. For example, if you have 150 million transfers from Ghana Commercial Bank to Ecobank Ghana, and vice versa, 80 million from Ecobank to Ghana, Bank of Ghana. What happens then after the close of business is that the central bank moves the cash 150 from Eco, um, Bank of, uh, Ghana Commercial Bank's deposit to Ecobank and vice versa. So at the end of the day, the net transfer will be 150 minus the 80, which is essentially 70 million in favor of Ecobank. And those transfers are done. The fiscal cash, might be moved later. But if these transfers are made and around midnight, it is realized that the Ghana Commercial Bank has overspent its deposit of maybe Ghana right now is 400 million. Then Ghana Commercial Bank will be required to pay an interest by the minute. So, in other words, so as long as that, de that deficit above its rates or its deposit is there, 
the bank will pay interest on that. So banks essentially always want to push up their funds that they've collected to offset these things, even though it might take a few time. So essentially that's what happens within the national or the Fed transfer wire transfer. The book transfer is within the same bank. Mm -hmm. And because it's in the same bank, it's managed by the bank itself. So if you have deposits in a branch that has to move to an account at another branch, those things are done internally. And that's the book transfer. Now the wire transfer is an external. So what happens, uh, foreign transfer, is external. So what happens is that once you initiate the process of the wire transfer, it is sent from your local bank to the central bank. And then the central bank moves it to the next hub until it gets to the central bank of that destination um, person who is supposed to receive the cash. Once it gets there, person will then be advised or credited in his account to take the money. So this is how it works. It's for every one of these transfers, you have central bank working to bring, um, to move these funds, whether it's within country or outside country. So when is it appropriate to use wire transfer? It is always appropriate when you have time is of essence. So you want to transfer some funds, you need it urgently. Then you use wire transfer. Again, if you have to transfer huge sums of money, then wire transfer becomes a better option. So examples are national debt, debt service and service payments of a country, okay? Like Ghana owes people of different international organizations and countries some money. At, at a certain date in the, in the month, Ghana has sent all these funds to the different um, people they owe. And because it's time bound and time sensitive, um, wire transfer is used. Okay, there are other examples like funding investments, adjusting balances, etc. These are all things that um, could be done using wire transfer. Now let's um, see how it's initiated. Now, the bank normally provide a template for customers who frequently wire funds to partners or to people up to um, companies or suppliers that they deal with. And so once you have the template, you can actually do this online from the corporate place to do it. However, if you're an individual and you walk into a bank, you can request for a wire transfer either from your account or you can pay cash on the counter for the wire to be done for you. That is more or less for the individual uh, non-repetitive, we call it the open wire to any wire. That's what is done most of them. Now let's talk about touch transfers. Um, the touch network, and I think Anna established an art network a few years back, well, four, three, four years back. Mm -hmm. It's essentially a batch process that stores and folds for future settings. So in other words, you have a batch of payments like a payroll of a thousand employees within an organization. What happens there is that you push the payments to the bank and the bank processes it bit by bit until all the payments are made. So that is essentially what batch is. In contrary to, in contradict, uh, in being contrary to 
the wire, which is instant. This one is actually a batch process for store and forward kind of uh, process. Now there are two types of batch transactions or batch transfers. We have the credit, batch credit, and then batch debit. Batch credit is always initiated by the sender. So I want to make some payments to a group of suppliers or to my staff. I make the request to the bank and the bank processes it. That's what we call the arch. You can do an inbound or outbound transaction. What do I mean? Inbound in the sense that payments, receiving payments, and sending out payments. But the sender's account is deposited and the receiver's account is credited. So that's the basic rule. But you can do outbound transactions and inbound transactions. Whatever transaction you're doing, you, the sender, is the one that initiates. The other type of batch which is the debit, is actually sometimes referred to as electronic drugs. And these are initiated by sender or receiver. Okay, so in that case, the receiver can actually prompt and for the transfer to be made. A typical example is the Ghana Revenue Authority that collects tasks from different organizations. The Ghana Revenue Authority can actually be a receiver of EMA and actually preemptively push to request for the payment to be made by the sender and then subsequently being sent. On the other hand, the sender to knowing the time when they have to pay their VAT and other things can actually move that money pre, I mean, preemptively or what should I say, proactively to get the thing done. So these are the two main things. The difference between the two being that the debit actually is able to be initiated both by the sender and the receiver, whereas the ad credit is normally done by the sender. So when do we use ad? This, we use ACH transfers when the appropriate number, oh, sorry, I take that again. We do this, we do use ACH transfers when we have a large number of payments to be made in a single plan. For instance, the government of Ghana has about 600,000 employees at the end of Every month, the controller and accountant general's department has to make payment to each and every one of these. There's a huge number of payments within one file. So, controller general sends it to the deposit bank or its bank that has the money, be it Bank of Ghana or any of the commercial banks. And then the bank now processes this over a period of time. So some employees might receive it early, depends upon maybe if it's done by a vertical order, they might receive it early and vice versa. So that's one example. Then if there's no agency of speed for this to be done, then we can also use it. In other words, if it's not like there's a deadline to the payment, you can use transfer, which can be transferred anyway, store forward, as we just mentioned. And then, of course, you can send any amount because unlike the wire transfer, where there's a certain minimum amount, you can actually pay for any transaction that you do. It is difficult to pay for some transactions that are less than the minimum amount and therefore it's a big problem. So as I've mentioned, one of the examples is outbound payable direct deposit and outbound vendor payment. So if you have a number of vendors, like Ghana Highway 
if he has to pay contractors at the end of the month, he uses a arch process to pay all of them. And then of course, like I mentioned earlier, in-bank taxpayer payments. The example that I mentioned with GRA. Of course, um, Arch Transfer can have addendums. You can add additional data uh, to whatever things to just to give clarity. So we have remittance data, for instance, being attached to each of the transactions that you make, and we interface with account receivable systems. In other words, if internally they have a system, accounts receivable system, you can interface it so that it becomes a computer to computer transaction. And of course, um, uh, other things uh, can also be done with it. So this is the slide that shows us how we actually the process takes place. So from the office of the controller and the control general for Ghana, for instance, um, initiation is made for the payments for all the company employees to the originating depository financial institution, which is the bank of the controller and accountant general's department. The bank then transfers these requests to the central bank, which is the main operator and can move money from different banks. It can take money from banks and deposit in other banks. So what it essentially does is for the 600 employees of government, for instance, they might have 22 different banks with, with their bank accounts. So the process here is essentially for the central bank to take their money and put it in their depository or receiving depository financial institution. And then, of course, once it gets to the institutions, the depository institutions, they are then credited to the account. And all these things will then be authorized or enrolled through between the receiving company employee and the originating employer, okay, to just reconcile the two. So this is a schematic diagram that shows how this whole process works. Now, so what are the key differences between the two types of transfer? Wire transfer normally has a very high overhead in the sense that there is a certain minimum amount in every country that you have to pay, whether your funds you're transferring smaller or bigger. Normally, the rule is pay that minimum if the figure is small, or pay a certain percentage, let's say one or two percent of the total funds that you're transferring. Now, that makes it a little bit expensive insofar as cost is concerned. Whereas the arch, it's pay as you go. So the number that you pay, or they have a certain limit beyond which they will not continue to charge you. So it's cheaper to use wire transfer, the arch transfer than wire transfer. The second thing is that the wire transfer is, has a, a sense of urgency. So trans, if you want to do same day funds transfer, of course, wire, wire transfers will generally take about three days, uh, especially if it's a foreign wire going across to other countries. However, if it's a national wire, then it can be done on the same day. And that means that you pay for the cost, but yet you get the service on the same day. On the other hand, ACH does, is time insensitive, and therefore, if you have transactions that are not based on time in that sense, of course, staff of government of Ghana pay is very, uh, people have to get their money on a certain, but if you start the process five days before the end of the month, hopefully everybody would have gotten it with it by the end of the month. The third thing is, um, or should I say fourth? Third thing is 
that wire transfer is used mostly for critical payments, example, debt servicing of a country where huge dollar values are taken. Whereas the arch is normally used for large batch of payments, example, payroll, okay? So these are the essential differences between the wire and the arch, which students need to know. The other things, as we see in the rest of the slide, just talks about other forms of electronic checks. Uh, we have the electronic checks, which has an online paper check and arch conventions, but these are not required for our things, and therefore we don't need to look at it in detail. But in terms of regulatory government, regulator governments, um, this has to do with how these things are set up. And essentially, the central bank issues um, these things per an electronic funds transfer act or regulation. So in every country, there's a need to have a kind of regulation that clearly define who is playing what role, but these things are normally issued by the central bank. And it, it covers arch and debit, card, debit cards, but not wire or credit cards. Right. Now, there's also an element of consumer protection uh, within these acts or regulations, which must protect people who use it. So some protection is afforded to the customer that does not apply to corporate or government, government uh, customers. Okay, so consumer focused, not uh, corporate or government. So there's a consumer protection bit of it. So um, the national to automatic, automatic clearing where House Association at the Ghana has established one of this. Uh, it actually applies to for arch transactions only and is applicable to both consumer and corporate banking. Uh, then there is also in the US a uniform commercial code which applies to wire transfers only. The uniform commercial code article does that applies to negotiable instruments, etc. So there is a whole batch of regulations and acts that can be used to govern how these things are done. And I believe when we look through the Bank of Ghana acts, we'll find some of these things embedded in there that gives the bank the authority to do some of these things. So in a nutshell, this is what is required for us to know. Um, I would be happy to take some questions from the online platform. So just let me know what are your issues and then we 